All right, so we'll do we'll do chapter 18 and uh, on the examples given by the Holy Fathers. Uh, so this is just the holy company of, of the saints and sages and just uh, being inspired by their lives. And these are the things that we can put our idle mind on, you know, when, <laughs> when we're doing nothing or have nothing important to do. We can always go and spend some time thinking about these stories and, and uh, I don't know, pondering them. Uh, you know, if you read them carefully, you always find something interesting to think about in something that they say or something that they do, kind of wondering why or how does that work. And it's always fun to dig in and to try and touch these things in your own mind, in your own self, uh, to take these truths out of the books and to put them into your life and to feel, to feel them, to see them, to experience them, and to know that they're true uh, because of that. Uh, and again, it greatly helps with developing the faith in the things that you can't do that with yet. Uh, and, and uh, you know, th it helps you to understand well, if all of these things are so, then that must be so as well. <laughs> so you get some strength there. He says, look at the shining examples of our ancient fathers and the saints in whom true perfection and religion flourished. And then you will see how little we do by comparison. How can we even compare our life with theirs? Yeah, I, I, I would take a different tack, really. I, I don't <laughs> if it's all right for me to have a little bit of a different slant on that. You know, I, I wouldn't do a comparison. What's the point of that? I mean, obviously, they were saints and sages, and their names have been remembered for a couple thousand years now. So we're not not competing like that. So we look more at them through for inspiration. Like, wow, look at the possibility. Uh, look, if you if you do give your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to the divine, look what happens. Uh, look, look at the blessings of their lives. Look at the strength of their character and the depth of their thinking. You know, to go and to just be inspired, be lifted up, uh, because they're not they're not going to race you. <laughs> And they're not going to compare themselves to you. Uh, they're going to put a hand out and uh, try and lift you up, try and take you forward. These friends of Christ served him amid all sorts of tribulations, hunger and thirst, heat and cold, labor and weariness, in vigils and fasts, holy meditations and prayers, and in the persecutions and insults. So all of the dual throng that, you know, and really this is the secret to spiritual life is finding that inner refuge from which to observe the dual throng instead of being in the dual throng, right? And so you have a, a place of safety, your refuge in the company of the divine, uh, which, which will help your discernment and help you understand the nature of what the dual throng is performing, <laughs> what's going on out there. And you don't have to be tossed to and fro in it. And you can learn a lot of that from the life of the sages, just seeing how steady-minded they were. You know, when, when the Bhagavad Gita says, you know, a, a person of steady wisdom, I remember looking at Swami Prabhupada and living with him for those 15 years. And I can say, I understand what a man of steady wisdom looks like. Someone who doesn't have moods, uh, someone who can be totally relied on, somebody who's fully present anytime you see them. Uh, someone who's very methodical and very stable in the way they, they move through the world. I always had the impression of a rock in the middle of a ra raging stream when I saw Swami Prabhupada in San, you know, in San Francisco, that city, of all that craziness and everything going on. And then there was always Swami Prabhupada Just, oops, <laughs> always steady, always calm, always thoughtful you know, and taking his time for everything. Consider the many and grievous, grievous trials endured by the apostles, the martyrs, the confessors, virgins, and indeed all the saints who followed in their footsteps of our Lord. In order to possess everlasting, everlasting life, they rejected honor and all of the pleasures of this life. Yeah, so this then that that kind of gives you a hint of what they had their eye on, you know, this immortality, this freedom that Swami Vivekananda talks about. That that's our inspiration, uh, you know. Although that I, there's, I have funny feelings about that approach. I mean, I'm trying to think of 
in the world of duality because uh you know christianity is a dual religion so they don't really well in, interestingly enough it's all there certainly it's all there but officially it's a dual religion and uh, that a practitioner will always be separate from god and so in in light of that you know they look forward to that day of being in the company a little bit different approach than the vedanta but uh certainly one of great joy and inspiration and that they found it worth uh, giving up all honors you know being being mendicants being wanderers being homeless and uh and you know you read paul's sufferings in the new testament he ended up going to jail several times and being beaten several times and ultimately all of the direct disciples uh perished were killed were martyred with the exception of one and that was saint john and he died in exile on the island of patmos and there's a beautiful story about him, which every time I talk about him being there in exile, I always remember and want to share. There's an old preacher in Texas when I was in college in seminary that told this story that, uh, you know, when he was an old man, all the brothers and sisters on Sunday morning at the gathering would always walk him up first uh, to the front of, the, of everybody. And he would always say the same thing. He would always gather his strength and he would say, my brothers, my sisters, love one another. And then he would sit down. <laughs> and that was that was his message, you know. And uh, I, that sums it all up. Love one another. This is the one most important thing. You can forget all the other else about religion if you want to. But that one shining mantra, love one another should always be apparent in the way that we think and treat others. How strict and mortified was the life of our fathers led in the wilderness. How many grievous temptations they endured and violent assaults of the devil. How fervently they prayed daily to God, imposing rigid fasts on themselves. What ardent zeal to advance in the spiritual life. What relentless war they waged against all sin, and with what pure and wholehearted intention did they aspire toward God? That, that, that Yeah, well, certainly we can see in that, that uh, <laughs> their yeses meant yes, and their noes meant no. And so they were very strong in their, uh, in their aim, in what they were doing. They knew themselves. That's the thing. Once we know ourselves, that, that becomes characteristic of us because we're not pulled. Right now, we're pulled into our desires because we're identified with them. That means when the mind brings up a desire of its own, we identify with it and say, that's my desire. And we go running after it because we haven't yet figured out who we are. And so whenever the body raises up a need or a desire, gets hungry or gets tired, we automatically think, oh, that's my desire, and we have to rush and fulfill that. And that's the slavery that the sages talk about. We're always uh, serving the desires of the mind or serving the desires of the body, rather than knowing that we are a third, the third in there, <laughs> that we are the self, and that the self is free. It has no desire. It has nothing that's necessary to change in the moment. It is bliss. It is wisdom. And it is the moment itself. It is existence. And so to, to know yourself is how you find this kind of ardent strength and this kind of tenacity uh, in the face of all kinds of uh, temptations. You know, like, like when you read uh, in Katu Upanishad, uh, you know, our young man there was, was Nachiketas, was very firm. When he was offered all of those things by the God of death, you know, all of those possibilities. And, and uh, Jesus, after his 40 days of fasting in the desert, when he was taken up and tempted. And, and then Buddha, when Mara appeared before him and offered him all of the, all of the, the fun of the world. And uh, you, you read all three of those accounts. They didn't have to pause and think about it. They were like, mm, well... How many did you say? <laughs> How long was that going to be for? 
Uh, well, mm, let me get back to you. Let me think about it. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like that. They knew who they were. And they knew that they had none of those desires, that all those desires belonged to someone or something else. Not someone else, but something else. They belonged to a mind or they belonged to a body. But they don't belong to the self. And so we find that that freedom. And that's that's why then, in search of that self, in knowing that inner nature, that is why you they fervently pray daily to God for that discernment, to have eyes to see, and imposing rigid fasts on themselves, you know, trying to bring their will under control, trying to bring their, their understanding uh, by denying the outside world. I don't know if you've done a fast before, but if you, if you do a fast, even if it's for a day, uh, it's quite tremendous how, how much you fall out of the cycle of life. You know, when everybody else in the world is going, bre getting breakfast and then going for coffee and then having lunch and then going home and having dinner. And if you skip all of those, uh, if you do it for, for a couple of days in a row, you, you really get the sensation of being outside of the world. You, you're, you're just out of step with what everybody else is up to. And uh, during that time when you're not eating, this is the important part about fasting. It's the part that many people forget, that fasting is not about not eating. A fast is about eating something different, which means going to the shrine and uh, eating some scripture, <laughs> eating some time with the beloved. So you don't just skip meals, you know, go up and grab a Nancy Drew book and fall asleep. During meals, you take your time, you go to the shrine, you spend that hour that you would be eating and cleaning, and you sit there with the, with the divine beloved and focus on that. And, uh, you know, when the hunger rises, you, you understand, you can tell very much that it belongs to the body. You know, that doesn't belong to you. And it will teach you to, to keep a steady no. You know, I remember one year, and I did a lot of fasting in college. <laughs> and uh, I remember I worked as a waiter at the at the Roadway Inn. <laughs> and I, I was in the kitchen that night, and I was fasting. And I was serving all this delicious food. <laughs> it was like, oh, my God. But my fast was over at midnight. <laughs> and I had been, I'd been going for a couple of days, not that long. But uh, I remember I started saving up a little taste of all the things that I desired <laughs> and put them aside. And I took them home. And I stayed up till midnight solely so I could wait until midnight when the fast was over and I could taste all this food. So I did that. But because, uh, you know, my stomach uh, had shrunk a little bit in those couple of days, I only got to eat about a third of what I had set aside before I was just too stuffed to eat anything else. And I was so disappointed, but that's not how you fast. <laughs> I say that more for the fun of, of life, but, uh, you know, it's better to, to, it's really a good, a good exercise fasting because you really can see how strong your no is, because if your no is perfect, if your no is no, and you understand that you don't fall back on your word to yourself, fasting is quite easy. When the hunger comes up, you just say no and you go on. But if you're not strong in your no, that hunger will nag and nag and nag and nag and nag and nag and nag. And, nag. and you'll, you may end up breaking the fast for it. But even if you don't, you're going to be miserable. So it's a good way to train your will, to, to train your no's to no's and your yeses to yes. And, uh, and really finding that inner strength. Because in spiritual life, that will make a big difference as to whether you suffer through this task or whether you enjoy it, whether you're free in it. You know, the person who's blessed with the ability to say yes and mean it or say no and mean it without any argument or discussion, uh, that person has a very enjoyable uh, experience of spiritual life. There, there's not a lot of that mental nagging going on and their, their, their renunciation is beautiful and freeing. It's not something that they carry a burden. It's it's there's it's it's you know because they're clear of what they're running toward, and couldn't care less about what they're leaving behind. Just no thought about it. Swami, yeah, Swami, uh, this is Stephen. Uh huh. Hi, Stephen. Yeah, I I don't know what the format is here. If if it's all right to add, uh, because about the you know what you were saying about the fasting. Uh -huh. um, 
is um, what my own experience has been is um, uh, it's not just food, but it could be almost anything that you have some attachment to. Sure. Um, and, and um, you know, some uh, behavior or habit that um, in, in some ways is not healthy. And yeah. uh, I mean, I found just going without uh, um, uh, my usual amount of caffeine for a week, how difficult that was just to significantly reduce my caffeine intake. Yeah. Yeah. These, well, that's these mortifications that they're talking about that they're referencing in this, this book, this verse here, a mortification is that it's, it's taking something that the body wants or needs and saying, no, or what the mind wants or needs. So you can give up, the, you know, the quitting coffee is a great one. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, it can also be an agreement to do something, you know, like uh, I'm going to read the entire gospel in the next seven days, you know, and so you divvy that thing up and you sit there and you just read, you just, you have to read a lot to cover that book in seven days. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it can be doing things also, these mortifications. It's about discipline. You're exercising that discipline muscle. It's like going to the gym for discipline. You know, it's like working it and learning how it, learning how it works and getting stronger in it so that when you need it, it's available to you. You can manage it. And so it carried them through all kinds of grievous temptations and how they endured violent assaults of the devil. You know, the devil for us is the ego. The ego constantly, you know, trying to exert itself, trying to protect your honor, trying to make sure you get enough respect, trying to make sure that, uh, you know, you're <laughs> whatever, you're looking good, you're, you know, well-fed, you're getting what you like, you're not getting what you don't like. You know, the ego is involved in all of that. And the ego is always trying to bring you back into body-mind because that's it's, that's where it's sourced in. But how fervently they, pray, they prayed daily to God, imposing rigid fasts on themselves, right? What an ardent zeal to progress in spiritual life. So that was the reason always behind it. It was just this desire. It was an expression of longing. Like, no, I'd rather be with God. I really want to be with the divine. I want to be in that company. And they've just raged this relentless war against everything that wasn't helpful to that end. You know, anything that wasn't helpful to peace of mind, anything that wasn't helpful to, to contentedness, anything that wasn't helpful to self-control. They just walked away from it with a wholehearted and pure uh, intention. And that's the trick. That's, that's the, the yes, be yes, and your no, be no. That's, Jesus says that. He said, let your yes, be yes, and your no's be no. Uh, and that's that requires wholeheartedness. It's when we're not wholehearted that we get into trouble. We start arguing, and that's when we. That's really when the when we go to war, right? And I've, I've mentioned this before. If you have a certain temptation, say uh, you like to have ten cups of coffee a day, and you're trying to get it down to two, and if you make a wholehearted effort when you've had your second of coffee, you're just done. And if it comes up in the mind again, you don't even pay attention to it. You just let it keep, you let it come and go. You just move past. Uh, but if you're not wholehearted, every time the mind brings it up, you have to sit there and consider it, you know, and you're like, no, no, I shouldn't. Oh, but it's only one more. You can have one more. Oh, it's one more. Oh, you can pick it up tomorrow. <laughs> you know? Anything like that. That's, that's when you lack wholeheartedness. And that's when, your desires become gnats, become mosquitoes. They're just buzzing in there all the time. They're just constantly nagging you because you know that you're not wholehearted about renouncing them. And there's a chance that they'll get in. And so uh, even though it feels like they are doing something, like they're sentient or something, they're trying to nag you. In fact, it's you nagging yourself because you are not being firm-hearted. Uh, you haven't removed that me and mine from the event, which is what the pure part of the pure and wholehearted intention is, right? As we aspire toward God, as we slowly approach that inner nature, that inner peace, that beauty that we are. <clears throat> they worked by day and they prayed by night. 
Their time was always profitably spent, for even in their physical labors they turned their minds to God and considered the time in his service all too short. Often they forgot the need for food, so controlling, so consoling were their contemplations. I said they were getting all their sustenance uh, from, from just that beautiful bliss of being in the company of God, the company of the divine. And we see that even in the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, that forgetting meals, you know, or just uh, being in the shrine for long periods of time. It wasn't because they were sitting in there pushing it, you know, type A <laughs> personalities, let's make this happen. Rah, rah, rah. It's because they were enjoying the company of God. And that's that's the beauty of our practice, is that we come to that place where, where meditation is beautiful where you sit there and you enjoy bliss. You enjoy the welling up of the presence, the, the, the sign of the presence inside, you know, that heart, when you feel that heart expansion, when you feel that warmth arise within the shrine of the heart, that indicates presence, you know, that indicates that the mother, the, the divine presence is there, God is there. And so everything else kind of goes into the background uh, that's when when spiritual life gets good. You know, Vivekananda says that the inner world is much bigger than the outer world, that the infinity of inner silence is much more interesting than the infinity of the changing world because it's direct experience. You know, it's an experience of the self uh, before the senses because it's intimately within you. And so that that is what we aspire to, that inner peace. We aspire to what we already have, but have not yet been able to pay attention to. They abandoned riches and honors, friends and families. They wanted nothing of this world, scarcely even taking what was necessary for the body. Outwardly, they were in need, but inwardly, they were filled with grace and spiritual consolation. Hmm. Filled with grace. You see, they learned how to accept grace. They learned how to accept the love of God. And so they were able to shut down the accuser, you know, the ego, which keeps track of your karma, keeps track of your right and wrongs. They were able to shut down the accuser and, and to just enjoy the presence, enjoy the company of God, not because of what they've done, not because of any of these other things that they had left behind, but because God had come to them. They understood that, that, that their spiritual life was a gift from God and not an accomplishment of their own, that it was free and full and utterly of God. And so they were filled with that grace because they let it in. They trusted it. They knew that it was true. And they let everything else go. And they were filled with spiritual consolation. That's that, uh, <laughs> that's that beautiful voice inside that tells you from the Divine Mother, from God, it's all right. It's all right. And it goes all the way down. Every one of your fears, every one of your guilts, every one of your trepidations in life, every one of your insecurities just tumbles out of sight. And just that voice from God, it's all right. It's all right. I've got you covered. They were strangers to the world, but to God, they were dear and intimate friends. In the world's eyes and in their own, they were despised as nothing. But in the eyes of God and his saints, they were beloved and precious indeed. True humility, simple obedience, charity, patience, in fact, all the virtues shone forth in them, right? Because they had killed the ego, they had killed that accuser. They had they had found they had found their true nature <coughs> through true humility. That's what that true humility is. True humility is the silence of the ego, the 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 surrender of the self, of our lower self, our idea of ourself, our idea of our needs, our idea of what we know and don't know. Uh, 
what who we like and don't like. That's true humility, letting go of that because you know that you are everyone and everything. Simple obedience, simple meaning it's not an argued thing. You know, the scripture says it, you just do it. You don't have to argue about it. <laughs> you don't have to put it on the calendar for, a, for something you'll learn to do later. <laughs> it's just a simple obedience. Charity, that's that compassion, that kindness, that open heart. So you're always aware of the love that's within you. And being aware of that love will open the gates of this charity. You'll practice it naturally. Uh, not because you see a need for it, but just because it's your nature to alleviate suffering. And so if you see it anywhere, you know, the awakened soul, soul is just there immediately. Not with a plan, not with any calculation, not because they can help others but just because it's their nature. It's what they do. They love, they care. Charity and patience, right? Nothing's rushed. Everything will be in its time. No worries. You know, remember Swami Prabhupada, it's one of the things about him. He lived on a totally different time scale because I'd be running around trying to get something ready for the retreat in May. And he'd be like, you know, I'd be like, Swami, Swami, I need to know, you know, what day do we do this? We do we, we are we going to do the information tent this year or not? And he would always be, oh, let us see. He would never give you an answer on the spot, you know, and then you'd be bouncing around for the next two or three days. Well, Maharaj, did you have a, oh, let us see. And then at some point he would get the answer and then he would tell you, oh, no, see, no tent this year. <laughs> But he would never hurry. He would never make a split decision. He would always take it before the mother. It's quite great. So this, this real uh, patience. In fact, all the virtues shown from them. Right? If all the virtues are shining in a person, that's indicative of one important thing. That the presence of God has begun to be who they are. At that uh, they are also becoming like an avatar. They're becoming a whole through which God is expressing, through which we can experience God. That is why they grew spiritually every day, gaining great grace from God. Right? That's how we grow spiritually, is by gaining grace, by gaining faith in grace, and opening our heart to this uh, unconditioned love and allowing it to inspire that within us, you know, that with which we are made, that image of God that is there. And so by filling ourselves with the grace of God, we live a life of gratitude, a life of inspiration. They were given as an example to all who desire to be holy. How much more, therefore, should they inspire us to advance spiritually than the number of the lukewarm influence, than the number of the lukewarm influence us to grow lax right well that's exactly it this is the important thing of why we shouldn't live comparing ourselves to others <laughs> because that's a trick of the ego the ego is trying to validate itself by the fact that it's doing better or at least doing as well as everyone else around us or considering you know that though yeah there's some people doing better and some people doing worse but i'm doing all right you know, so if you live a life of comparison, comparison like that, it's the wrong spirit because, you know, what, what good is that? <laughs> it's, you know, if, I mean, really, <laughs> what good is that at all? That's a silliness, complete silliness. So we don't compare ourselves to others. We work by inspiration. Uh, we, we hold our ideal in Thakur or Ma or Buddha or Jesus or Swamiji or Chaitanya. Any of, the, any of the great saints, any of the great incarnations, uh, we, we hold, those are our ideal. That's what we hold in front of us. And if we can't meet that ideal, what we do is create a working ideal, right? You don't lower the ideal. We always keep, we always keep Tako or Ma, Swamiji, or our chosen ideal. We always keep that as the ideal. No, that's what we've got to go for. But to keep ourselves from being overcome with discouragement, <laughs> and not being there, you 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 create a working ideal. You know, I can't quite get up at 3.30 in the morning every day to do my meditation. Okay, well, I'm going to start getting up 
by eight. And I'll do my do a half an hour of my of meditation at eight o'clock every day. You know, so you 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 give yourself a working ideal. You set an ideal between you and the ultimate, one that you can work with, and you work on that one and achieve that one. And then you set a new, you raise your working ideal, right? But you don't let the mind accuse you of, of failing. You just keep going. That's why Takor says go forward with that famous story. Right? And this important thing of not growing lukewarm just because everybody around you is lukewarm. That's that's a real call to warning there. You know, live your life from inside, from inspiration, from inside. You know, a lot of there's a lot of lukewarmness in this world. There's a lot of indecision. There's a lot of laziness. And if we're looking for excuses for that, we're going to get in trouble because there'll be plenty of them. But we have to live from the inside out. We live in the company of God. How fervent were the religious when their institutions were founded? What devotion and prayer, what zeal for virtue, and what strict discipline was maintained? Reverence and obedience under the rule of the superior prospered, right? When things are new, it's, a, you know, one of those things that you find in every religion. In Christianity, we used to talk about the lifers, you know, those people who were born and raised in Christianity and just how dull around the edges they were, right? Because they'd heard this their whole lives and this had all become normal to them. They were no longer amazed by these things. And then we had the converts, you know, the converts were always just bouncing around with the zeal, <laughs> all excited about this new life, this new opportunity, this new vision. And, uh, you know, that's the way we should be, you know. <laughs> so if you're a lifer in, in Vedanta, you know, it has, then practice what Nishrigadatta says. Every time you open the scripture, don't ever say that you've read it before because you haven't. This moment is new. And there is nothing about this moment that was like the last moment. So every time you open the scriptures, read them again for the first time. Don't ever assume that you know something. If you read a scripture with the idea that you've read it before, you're only going to see in it what you saw before. But if you read it for the first time again, uh, new things will open up to you. New ideas will open up to you when you when, from in there. That's one of the beautiful and mysterious things about scripture is that the same verse can teach you throughout your life a whole slew of different things each time that you look at it, each time that you read it. That was one of the tricks Swami Vedananda used to do at Shanti Ashrama every year. Every night in the evening when we'd read, he'd put the gospel on the table like this and he would let it fall open to a page. you know, And he would always say, you know, this is what mother has chosen for us to hear tonight. And I tell you, if, when you read something with that idea, Mother has chosen this for me to read right now, you listen to it much more closely. You pay much more attention to it than if you just think, oh, I just opened the book randomly and started reading. Then you're very casual about it. But understand that which you are allowed to open and read is because it was allowed to you. It was given to you. Remember that story I told about sitting in that library at that devotee's house with Swami Prabhutananda? And this person had floor-to-ceiling books on all the walls in a high-ceiling room. And I was like, wow, Maharaj, look how many books he has. And Swami just smiled, and he looked around for a moment at them, gazing at them, and he said, yes, one can own all the books in the world, but one will only be able to read the ones that their karma allows. You know, so just think every the fact that you can pick up a book like this or that you can pick up the gospel or you can pick up any of the scriptures and read. Don't take that for granted. There are many people in this world that are not allowed to pick them up and read them. Right. They have not come to that place. The mother, that level of grace yet from the divine. And so when you sit and you pick up a scripture, have some reverence for it. You know, have some reverence for the moment and some gratitude and some sense of some sense of profundity. Like what will be found here? Why this? What am I supposed to be reading today? You know, that's always a nice thing. Like after you've read and you're going to quit reading, 
ask yourself, what has mother given me today? And see if you can summarize what you've learned from what you've just read. And if you can't, go back and read it again. <laughs> we don't want to just get things done with. We want, it's a good practice after you've read a page or two, or however much you want, however often you want to stop. But after you've stopped, stop and see if you can paraphrase it to yourself, what you just read. If you were going to teach those two pages to somebody, teach them to yourself and go ahead and let yourself teach them to you. And that will help you integrate these things so they become a part of you. They, 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 they come out of the head and they enter into your heart and you begin to find yourself being that way through their inspiration. The history of their deeds bears witness to their holiness and perfection by which they were able to subdue the world and trample it beneath their feet. Nowadays, those who can keep the rule and maintain patience in what they have undertaken are thought the world of. How sad it is that through our own negligence and wasting of time, we have fallen so quickly from our first fervor and are even tired of life itself. God grant that the desire to advance in virtue be not dormant in you, who so often have had the examples of the saints before you. Right? That's that Thomas, you know, when Thomas begins to predominate, that inertia, where we just can't quite get ourselves going, and so we start cutting corners, and we start being more and more lax. You know, that's something that I'm experiencing that I have to really be careful of living on my own. You know, in the monastery, I've got a whole army of monks around me that if I'm not, if I'm not in the shrine for meditation, you know, or if I come, if I miss a meal or if they haven't seen me for some time, you know, that accountability is there because you've got a brotherhood going on. Here, I live in a room by myself. You know, I could, I could roll out of bed at noon every day. <laughs> I promise you I haven't, but, <laughs> but it's there, you know, and I, and I noticed my, from my first few months here, the creep starts to happen. You know, you're like, at first you're just holding it all, holding it, the tradition, you know, you're getting up at the same time you get up in the monastery. And then one day you wake up and you're like, oh gosh, why am I getting up so early? There's, I don't have to get anything done. I've already done the classes. I can stay another half hour. So you start staying another half hour. And then the body gets used to staying another half hour. and You've adjusted your schedule for the extra half hour. And then again, you're like, well, you know, I still am wanting to plenty of time. I don't have to get up right now. So this practice of making your yes is yes and your no is no, that's getting up early in the morning is a great practice of that. If you say you're going to get up at 530 or you're going to get up at 630, whatever time you say, make it happen. There is no snooze button for a spiritually minded person. Hmm. No snooze button for the spiritually minded. When that alarm goes off, there's not a question in your mind. You're out, you're up, you're done. Not a question. Don't even allow, don't entertain even the hint of the body coming in and saying, oh, but the sheets are so warm and the pillow is so soft. And, oh, I've got, I can get 10 more minutes. Oh, 10 more minutes. Just give me 10 more. Okay, 10 minutes. <laughs> no, see, that's how we lose. That's how we lose is that way. It's so easy if you just cut it off. If you just like, you just know, your alarm goes off, I'm out of bed. You just, you don't, don't even let that, that conversation happen. Just boom up, all done. And it's so much easier. The other side, when you sit there and have that conversation, oh, there's that part of you that feels dirty. <laughs> You're like, oh, I know I should get up. I just don't feel like it. And the reason it's important is because every single advancement in spiritual life will have that same process if you don't weed it out. You know, all of your renunciation is going to look like that. Like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I don't have to do that today. <laughs> you know, oh, I had a great meditation yesterday. I can have a short one today. <laughs> 
When we start doing that, oh, we get dull around the edges and the joy falls out. That's the first thing that goes away is the joy of practice, the joy of the presence, right? And then it becomes a slog. You know, oh God, I've got to meditate, right? And you're sitting there, you're getting up, you brushed your teeth and you've bathed and you're going into your room and you're like, oh God, I have to sit here for a whole hour. All right, <laughs> here we go. And then you get a half hour into it and you're like, oh, my mind just won't calm down today. There's no sense in doing this. I'll just get up early and work more tomorrow. You know, we start doing that kind of stuff. And so he's warning us here, don't do it. Don't be that way. Really, why? Not because you're going to hell. <laughs> Not because mother's going to beat you with a stick. But you're going to lose your you're going to lose your own awareness of the presence. Those things of the mind are going to crowd in and make noise. You know, the, those desires of the body that kept you in bed have now been given permission to express themselves to you. And so why do you think they're going to stop with keeping you in bed? They're going to start bringing up all of the other things also. And if you, if you haven't practiced that, that self-discipline to where you can get up when it's time to get up and move forward, then you can be free. And that, that integrity inside uh, is, is, is part of what manifests bliss, you know, because, because through that discipline, the mind is quieted. Through that discipline, the arguing mind is quieted. And we get that sense of inner peace. We know we're doing what we need to do. We know that we're being strong. We know that we're being disciplined. And so that gives you access to a whole new level of mind that you can't see if you're not living that way. If you're not living that way, you've become very accustomed to a noisy mind, very accustomed to compromises, and you've learned how to justify them and you have to go through the same process every time. <laughs> it's just not necessary. All right. And that's what he says, how sad it is that through our own negligence and wasting of time, we have fallen so quickly from our first fervor, right? From the, from the beginning days when this was so exciting, right? So in chapter 19, we talk, chapter 19, on the exercises of a good religious, I guess a good religious is a spiritual seeker. So on. That's, I would never like to call myself a good religious, but <laughs> so don't get me a t-shirt that says a good religious. <laughs> the life of a good religious should be distinguished by virtue, right? Obviously, all the expression, anything leading toward oneness is a virtue. So you're always looking for oneness, always looking for togetherness. Being inwardly as one appears outwardly. So your inner world and your outer world are the same. You're not inside being a nasty booger and outside being nice to everybody. Good morning to see you. Oh my God, I hate her. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> you don't, don't, don't be that person. Why? Because everybody in the room except you knows that you're being fake, right? Everybody knows. And, and, and then what, when you get known to be that, that person who, who lives in a persona, you've got your office persona, you've got your best friend's persona, you've got your time at home persona, you know, and, and you know what they are, the, all these little, um, that's why I was giving a hard time about the voices at the beginning, you know, these personas that we put together, that we present ourselves with to the world. It's a very American thing, actually. The Europeans, I don't see so much of that. They're, they're willing to... They're willing to be what we would think was rude, you know, not look at, not make eye contact with you on the street, not introduce you to their, you know, in Germany, if, if you're with a friend and you meet a, a, your, one of your friends, it's not customary to, to introduce the two people together because they accept the fact that <laughs> that's not necessary. They're not, they're my friend, you know. And, and so not until like the third or fourth time, if it happens three or four times in a row, then you would introduce that person to them because it, it seems like, oh, there's some need for that. 
And so there's a level of honesty <laughs> in, the, in their associations with each other. And so, but in ourselves, just always make sure, check yourself. If you know, when you get that weird feeling inside, like, am I doing the right thing? <laughs> then just ask yourself, is this leading toward oneness? Is this building bridges? Is this bringing me together? Am I seeing God everywhere by this? Or is this requiring separateness? Is this requiring other? And if it is, then that's, then that's vice. You know, all virtue leads to oneness. Being inwardly as one appears outwardly. For he who sees the heart is God, whom we should always reverence. Right? You see, you see yourself always. You know yourself. And that is God knowing himself. Right? If you see it and you are aware of it, God sees it and God is aware of it. Because thou art that. But even if you don't know that thou art that part of it yet, you can know. There's, there's no hiding. And so live a life that doesn't need to be hidden. That's, that's the best way. Live a life that doesn't need to be hidden. If there's something that you're doing, you know, that you think needs to be hidden, just don't do it. That's all. In the monastery in San Francisco, there was a, a monastery rule. You couldn't close your door. So the door to your room was always open. And that was part of that whole idea. You know, Ramakrishna says that the that a sadhu never closes a blind, never locks a box, you know, because the sadhu is living a life open to everyone. You know, you want to check my phone? Yeah, here's my phone. You want to look at my browser history? Yeah, here's my browser history. Take a look. You know, if you live that way, then you've got that confidence. You've got that fierceness inside uh, because, you know, truth builds truth and strength really are synonyms well not necessarily synonyms but if you if you're a truthful person you're going to be a strong person right because you don't have any that internal shakiness going on you know something that i learned as a as a as a as a teacher you know sitting here and <laughs> it's one of the most one of the most challenging things for me actually is you know when i'm sitting here and i'm reading these scriptures and i'm in a position where i have to teach them I can't teach them with any strength whatsoever if, if half of my mind is like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, if I know that I'm being a hypocrite, that doesn't work. And, and Ramakrishna says that if a person is a great speaker but, but is not a person of conviction, a person of integrity, then their words are forgotten immediately. You know, everybody will sit and really enjoy a wonderful lecture, Right. But as soon as they leave the room, they leave the words. But if a person is a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, and they speak truth, those words stay with you. They stick because there's some subtle communication that happens. That's why Vivekananda, when he was lecturing at one time in New York, he said, I, I felt as if I could give every person in that room enlightenment at that moment. And so I stopped speaking and sat down. <laughs> which I'm not sure I still know why he would do that, but I'd be like, well, why? Well, go ahead. What do you do? Why would you sit down? You know, but then it was explained to me, at least Swami Prabhupada said, well, because they weren't ready for it. He could have given it to them, but they couldn't have held on to it. And, uh, you know, and that excess of energy, that excess of prana, which would have been caused by it, will then spill out through all of the holes through all of their vices, all of their ignorances, would be empowered, right? That's why I, I asked Swami, this is a great teaching. Uh, I asked Swami one time why we didn't do any intense sadhana retreats like the Buddhists do, you know, where they go and do their 10-day vipassana, eight hours a day, you know, meditation and sitting. And I said, why don't we do that, Maharaj? And he said, oh, see, it is better to do a little bit every day in a steady way and hold that rhythm for your life. He says, because what happens, those, those, those intense periods are great if you are a person of intensity, which means that your practice when you're not at the retreat is very similar, that you're doing lots of practice and you're very disciplined, you're very self-controlled. Then an intense retreat like that is helpful to you. He says, but if you are somebody who doesn't have an established practice that you're dedicated to, and you go and you do this 10-day retreat, 
He says, you will, you will get a very great benefit while you're in the company of all the holy people. He says, but then when you go back home, if you're a lusty person, you're going to be an extremely lusty person. If you're an angry person, you're going to be an extremely angry person until that prana that you've collected from that practice is dissipated, right? And so it's better to have a regular practice where you learn to moderate your in interior and you're, you're able to manage the, the energy that comes up within you from having a great meditation uh, and, and, and that you don't fall victim uh, to your vices because you haven't learned to block the doors to hold that energy in so that it can be pushed up to the heart, you know, pushed up farther on up the track, as it were. He who sees the heart is God, whom we should always revere. We should walk in his presence as pure as the angels. Right? Which, you know, if you're walking in his presence with awareness, you're going to be pure as the angels. <laughs> You're going to be purer than the angels because your purity is a direct response to the presence of God. You know, angels are pure for, well, whatever it is. I'm not going to pretend I know why the angels are pure. We should walk in his presence as pure as the angels. Just like Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence said, you know, when I'm in the presence, when I walk in the presence, I will not even pick up a straw from the ground without his command. You know, I will do nothing that would be displeasing to my beloved. And that's living in the presence. That's part of it. But living in the presence, you don't do those things because you don't want to do those things. Because you're in love. Because you're enjoying the company of the divine. Because you want more of that company. You know? You don't make your girlfriend or your boyfriend a birthday card because you have to. At least, unless you're married for 50 years. <laughs> But it's always a matter of inspiration, right? You make that card, you can't wait to give it to them. You're like so excited. You spent all this time on it. And then you give it to them and they're thrilled to death. You know, I remember, yeah, giving flowers to my mother as a kid. I used to go pick wildflowers to make a bouquet for my mother. I used to love to give that to her. She would be so excited and so <laughs> warmed up by it. And that's how our practice is. We're excited to do it, you know, to, to give it to the Lord. Every day, this is a good one here. Every day, renew your, renew your dedication to the Lord, right? Arousing fervent devotion in your heart. How do you do that? By singing a song, by repeating a prayer, by chanting some verses, uh, by saying your mantra, uh, by mentally worshiping the divine, all those ways. Arouse the fervent devotion in your heart as if it were the first day of your turning back to God. Pray to him saying, help me, Lord Jesus, to persevere in my good resolutions and in your holy service until death. Help me to begin this day well, for up to now I have done nothing. Right? It's like have that, have that, that freshness in your mind. When you start the morning, you should have a little morning routine that you do every day, you know? A little thing i used to i used to put a little verse when i was in the monastery in in hollywood i had a bunk bed that i got at ikea <laughs> so that i could have a desk under it but when i sat up on that bed i would hit the rafter <laughs> right in front of my head because i was too close to the ceiling and so i ended up putting a little verse on the front of that rafter <laughs> <laughs> and made it part of my day to start with reading that little verse so that I wouldn't absentmindedly get up and bang my forehead into it every day. And so start a, start a great one. Start a fun one, you know. Do something exciting. Blow a bugle. <laughs> you know, dance around. I always start, I always go in and, and laugh, you know, at, at, my, at myself in the mirror. That's my first thing. I go in and I, I see, you know, I remember looking at myself at 20 and I see myself looking at myself now at 60 and I'm like, ah, <laughs> you know, make sure that I understand aging is hilarious. There's nothing negative in this. You know, we're on our way to the divine. So come up with these silly little rituals like that. Make them fun. Make them lively. Make them expression of a real love and a real joy. 
and uh, start your day with that and keep yourself in that space. Keep it fresh and new because it is fresh and new. Every moment is brand new. Every moment you get to start again. So you don't have to keep track of anything. You don't have to be the person you were yesterday. You, know, you don't have to take into account the past. Take into account this moment alone and be free and be the person you want to be now, even if you never have before. This moment is new. This moment you get to be starting all over. All right.